15 minute or less lecture series, Anatomy and Physiology, Chapter 9, The Nervous System, Part 1. The nervous system structurally is broken down into two main regions. You have the central nervous system composed of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system composed of the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. And just so you know, nerves are bundles of axons found in the peripheral nervous system. All right, we also can divide the nervous system functionally. Functionally, we have the sensory division. This is where sensory receptors detect some sort of stimulus, transmit that to the sensory neurons, and then send the information to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is in the integrative region where the information is processed and decide on whether or not there should be a response. And then we have the motor division, where signals are sent from the central nervous system out to affect effectors, either the somatic nervous system affecting skeletal muscles or the autonomic nervous system affecting smooth muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and glands. Uh, histology, if you look at the uh, bit of nervous tissue, you will see a neuron, a very large cell with lots of processes coming off of it, and also many, many, many smaller cells called neuroglia. And here we can see the nucleuses of many of these neuroglia. Uh, the neuron has a cell body, a large area where you'll find the nucleus and all the main metabolic organelles you expect of any cell. Also coming off of it are these small processes called dendrites. Dendrites receive signals and then transmit them toward the cell body and then to the axon. The axon is a very long process that then carries the signal out to the next cell, which could be another neuron or an effector, etc. Uh, when the signal is being sent down the axon, it will eventually arrive at what is called a synapse. Synapse is where the neuron is trying to transmit information to another cell, either another neuron or an effector. There is usually a little space between the neuron that's uh, sending the signal and the neuron that, or effector that's to receive it. This space is called a synaptic cleft. Uh, the nerve impulse cannot jump across that. Instead, neurotransmitters are released at the end of the axon. They diffuse across the synaptic cleft and then bind to the dendrites or cell body of the receiving cell. Uh, this should seem familiar, should look sort of like the neuromuscular junction in the previous unit. Uh, neuroglia are the cells that are in nervous tissue that help support and aid and protect the neurons. Turns out neuroglia are more numerous than neurons. Uh, functions of neuroglia include things like supporting neurons, providing a structural framework for the nervous tissue, providing myelin sheath on the axons, phagocytosis to engulf any pathogens, and cool, the neuroglia can also divide. Uh, in the central nervous system, you have microglia. Microglia are little bitty cells that wander around and phagocytize, engulf any bacteria, any pathogens, and cellular debris. You have the oligodendrocytes that send out processes that wrap around regions of the axons, forming myelin sheaths around those parts of the axons. This helps speed up the nerve impulse, also known as an action potential. You have sheets of endem Epidemal cells, epidemal cells line the ventricles in the brain and produce cerebral spinal fluid. And finally, we have the astrocytes, the most dynamic of the uh, glial cells. The astrocytes provide physical support to neurons, help to regulate the nutrients and ions that enter the nervous tissue, can form scar tissue to replace any damaged neurons, and form the blood brain barrier. So the processes of the astrocytes wrap around the capillaries in the brain spinal cord. This acts as a shield and limits what can actually enter the nervous tissue, which the goal is, of course, to limit the pathogens that are able to get into the brain and spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells. Schwann cells are wrapped around a single portion of an axon, forming the myelin sheath around that region. Uh, again, myelin sheath helps to speed up the action potential. Uh, dendrites. Again, dendrites are short little processes that are usually receptive. They will be receiving signals from other uh, neurons or other um, structures. Uh, the only the cell body, cell body is the nucleus. It has uh, many mitochondria. It has the stuff called uh, chromatophilic substances. This is just clumped areas where there's lots and lots of protein synthesis occurring and it looks kind of gray in color. Uh, then we also have nerve Fibrils. No fibrils are fine, fine like structures, a specialized region of the cytoskeleton needed to carry materials to the ends of the axon. 
The axon has an axon helix, sort of a cone-shaped beginning of the axon coming off of the cell body. You have then the very, very long axon itself. Occasionally it has a little a branch called a collateral, although that's relatively rare. When you finally get to the very end of the axon, it will have these little widened areas called synaptic knobs. And these are the portions that will send the information, release the neurotransmitters to uh, at a synapse. Uh, axons are almost always, well not always, but often myelinated by Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. This acts as an electrical insulator that helps speed up the transmission of the action potential. Uh, basically, the Schwann cell or oligodendrocyte wraps tightly around that portion of the axon many, many, many times. There are also little gaps in this myelin sheath called node of, many of them nodes of Ranvier, so many nodes of Ranvier. There are a few neurons out there that are unmyelinated, but in general, most of them are myelinated. So here's a myelinated area. You can see in this case, the Schwann cell has wrapped around again and again and again. So basically, it's a very thick layer of just the cell membrane of the Schwann cell. And this myelination is white in color. So this means when you look at a cross-section of uh, spinal cord or brain tissue, you will see white areas. White because there's lots and lots of myelinated axons in that area. And gray matter. Gray because there's lots of cell bodies and filled with chromatophilic substance, which is grayish, and also a lot of synapsing going on in that area. So some structural variations in neurons. We have the multipolar neuron, the most common. There are lots of dendrites coming into the cell body, which then leads to the axon found in all the cell bodies in the central nervous and some in the peripheral nervous system. Then we have the bipolar neuron, extremely rare, where you have dendrites at one end leading to the cell body, which then becomes the axon at the other end. Bipolar is mostly in specialized neurons for sensations found in the eyes, nose, and ears. And finally, we have the unipolar neuron. Somewhat common, it is all of the sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system, where you have the dendrites leading into the axon, and the cell body is completely processed, uh, bypassed. Ganglion. A ganglion is a mass of neural cell bodies all clumped together in the peripheral nervous system. An example of this is the posterior root ganglion found uh, in or near the verbal uh, canal. Types of neurons can also be defined by their functions. So we have sensory neurons. Sensory neurons carry a sensation from the receptor up to the central nervous system. Sometimes the sensory neuron is the receptor. And this will then synapse with potentially an interneuron. Interneurons are the neurons found in the spinal cord and in the brain. They're all multipolar. They receive, process, and send out impulses. They're only found in the central nervous system. And then finally, the motor neurons. The motor neurons are the ones that are going to carry information out of the central nervous system to the effector to cause the response. Uh, so motor neurons control muscular contractions and secretions from glands. So sensory receptor sends information to sensory neuron, which then sends it to the interneurons within the central nervous system. They receive, process, integrate the information, then send a response through the motor neuron out to the effector. Nuclei. Nuclei are specialized masses of neural cell bodies found in the central nervous system specifically in the white matter of the central nervous system. So the nuclei will look kind of gray within the white matter. A synapse, again, as we already know, synapse is the functional connection between two neurons or a neuron and a receptor. We have the presynaptic neuron bringing the signal, the postsynaptic neuron that will receive the signal and continue the transmission. And the transmission occurs across the synaptic cleft. Um, it crosses the synaptic cleft by the release of neurotransmitters. So the uh, presynaptic neuron will release neurotransmitters that will then bind to the postsynaptic neuron to generate an action potential. So here's the synaptic knob at the end of an axon. A signal has arrived. It causes the synaptic vesicles to migrate to the surface of the synaptic knob, releasing the uh, neurotransmitters. This is an example of exocytosis. Neurotransmitters that are received via exocytosis will then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to postsynaptic neurotransmitter receptors, which are also known as uh, 
a type of channel because when the neurotransmitters bind to these receptors, it'll open an ion channel, which would be called a ligand gated ion channel, allowing ions to enter the uh, postsynaptic neuron. Uh, neurotransmitters can be excitatory to lead to the generation of an action potential or inhibitory to prevent it. Uh, so the cell membrane is normally polarized. It's normally slightly negative on the inside, positive on the outside with a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. Uh, there's a high concentration of sodium ions outside of the neuron, giving it a positive charge, and a high concentration of potassium ions inside, with a lot of other stuff leading to an overall negative charge. Uh, these ions are constantly leaking, so sodium ions are constantly entering, potassium ions are constantly leaving, so we need membrane, trans, uh, membrane channel proteins to lead to the reestablishing of the resting Potential. This is specifically done by the sodium potassium ion pumps doing active transport that requires energy. So the pump will continually send sodium out to maintain high concentrations outside the cell and continually pump uh, potassium channels in, leading to a high concentration of potassium on the inside. So it's spending energy all the time to maintain the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. To generate a synapse, we have the neurotransmitters released. They bind to the ligand gated sodium ion channels. Sodium ion enters, leading to depolarization aka making the uh, area where the ions are entering more positive, depolarization more positive. Um, so here it is, so in channel, bind, uh, with the ligand binding, the binding causes channels to open, sodium floods in, causing depolarization. This is a type of facilitated diffusion. Um, if there's just a few of them open, you'll get depolarization, but it won't lead to response. If you want an action potential, you have to reach threshold of negative 55 millivolts. So if you have threshold reached, enough channels are opened up, enough sodium ions flood in, then you get an action potential, which will move down the membrane and continue down the axon to the end of the axon through the opening and closing of ion channels. So, uh, Threshold was reached, you get massive depolarization. The action potential this is then repolarized, maybe hyperpolarized a little bit, aka getting even more negative, and then reestablished at resting membrane potential. This is an all or none response, either happens or it doesn't. So, neural impulse, opening of voltage gated sodium ion channels because the threshold being reached. This leads to lots of sodium ions entering, causing the action potential, the massive depolarization. This will cause the neighboring. Uh, potassium ion cha voltage gated channels to open and then the potassium will leave, re-establishing uh, resting potential. Uh, so basically the way it happens is one area gets depolarized because threshold was reached. This will then uh, continue to move down the axon into region and region and region. So each localized change in voltage will lead to the next area to change, having its channels open, cause the next area to change, having its channels open, and so on. There's no going back because we have a refractory period. We need time to reestablish the proper gradients of sodium potassium ions because that got all screwed up. So sodium potassium ion channels, maintaining the resting membrane potential, reestablishing the pop appropriate gradients of the ions, ligand gated sodium channels, leading to threshold being generated if enough neurotransmitters bind to enough ligand gated sodium channels, and then the voltage gated channels causing the action potential, either sodium voltage gated ion channels to depolarize or potassium voltage gated ion channels to repolarize. Uh, myelination helps to speed this up, where basically the action potential jumps from node of Brand Bay to node of Brand Bay. Um, inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters can bind, they will make the, the uh, membrane more negative, more hyperpolarized, while excitatory will make it more positive. So basically you just have to get a balance between the two until you reach a threshold to get an action potential. Here are some various neurotransmitters, we got acetylcholine, we have various neurotransmitters based on amino acids, parts of amino acids, and uh, a small chain of amino acids, and then we have some gases. 